How do young herbivores learn to cope with foraging challenges? There are various facets to this process. They involve interactions between social learning and trial and error learning. Social interactions enable offspring to learn quickly to identify nutritious foods and to avoid those that are toxic. Young animals remember specific foods, just as humans learn and remember plants in a garden, and they're wary of unfamiliar foods. Animals also learn to associate the flavors of specific foods with their post-ingestive consequences. If the consequences are positive, satiating feedback from needed nutrients such as energy and protein, animals gradually increase intake until the food becomes part of the diet. If the consequences are negative, nauseating feedback from toxins, herbivores limit their intake of food based on the concentrations of toxins in the food. Research of the last 20 years has shown that animals are very good at meeting needs for nutrients and avoiding uh, toxins, basically limiting their intake of toxins. The body really was the first biochemist, the first physiologist, the first neurologist, the first nutritionist. What we do in science is really to try to understand how the body does what it does. There are three terms that people use all the time in this area of research or management and they're intake, preference, and palatability. What are they? Intake is the amount of food that an animal ingests. Preference is choice given alternatives. Palatability is a little bit more nebulous and it's a term that really integrates a whole bunch of, of ideas, concepts, data. In Webster's Dictionary, if you look up palatability, you'll find it defined as a hedonic response of creature to food depending on taste, odor, and, and texture. Our work of the last 20 years has led us to think of palatability in a different way. Uh, our definition of palatability is the interrelationship between a food's flavor and its post-ingestive consequences, which depend upon nutrients and toxins in the plants, and all of that being influenced by an animal's past experiences with the food. You've got two things interacting here. You've got the cultural part and the foods that we eat as we're reared become palatable simply as a function of uh, being exposed to those over and over again culturally. And then there's the feedback part that also interacts with that. As an animal ingests a food, cells and organs of the body are sending signals back to the palate to um, influence palatability, basically. So palatability becomes a lot more than simply a matter of taste. The month of October when I'm spreading my ryegrass, I usually put two pounds of Osceola clover, and I put a quarter pound of purple top turnips per acre in my rod. The uh, purple top turnips grow right on the top to where the cows can come and eat the green, and they also grab on to the, uh, to the turnip itself, to the root, and eat it down. And when I turn them in for that hour and a half of grazing, the first thing they do is go and eat they fill of turnips, then they go graze the ryegrass. That turnip is about 80% TDN. The protein is very low on it, but then you have about 22% protein in the ryegrass. And it's a high energy food. And when those cows stay that energy, they know what it's all about. They grab it first. What that starts to really relate to is nutritional wisdom. And in the past, people in uh, animal science and range science literatures, I think, have not been fond of the notion of nutritional wisdom because it, it implied some sort of conscious knowledge by the animal. Um, I often like to use the analogy of digestion. How many people stop to think about which enzymes to release to digest particular foods? We don't do that this relationship between flavor and feedback is in the same vein. We don't stop and we don't even need to stop to think about it. It happens automatically uh, in the absence of any sort of conscious thought about it. We've done experiments where we put animals in deep anesthesia after they've eaten a food and during the time that the feedback event is occurring. And if it's a mild dose of a toxin, when they awaken and they're tested a week later, they still acquire an aversion to the food. And the reason is simply that feedback occurs automatically every time food is, is eaten. Now, a lot of times it's not even a rational thing. Most people have had the experience of eating a food and then either getting seasick or getting the flu or something like that. 
and they acquire a very strong aversion to the food. Well, we know at the conscious level that it's not the food that caused the problem. It was the flu or seasickness that caused it. Still, we have a very strong aversion to the food, and it reflects the fact that feedback happens automatically, and, it, and it's simply not a conscious kind of thing. The mixture of different plant species available to herbivores influences how much they eat and how well they perform. No single food contains the required mix of macronutrients, minerals, and vitamins. Animals must consume a variety of foods, each of which contain different toxins that are detoxified in different ways in order to meet nutritional needs, because toxins limit how much of each food an animal can eat. For instance, sheep and cattle can eat more of a combination of clover, which contains cyanogenic glycosides and endophyte-infected tall fescue, which contains alkaloids, than they can of either food alone. Tall fescue, you know, gets a lot of uh, bad publicity. Uh, a lot of people think it's bad, but truthfully, in this part of the world, tall fescue made the cattle industry. It made Missouri second in the nation in cattle production. If it wasn't for tall fescue, we wouldn't be there. Uh, and tall fescue has its problems, but if we learn over a period of time how to, to deal with it and how to manage those problems, we can lessen the effects. There's uh, several symptoms that cattle exhibit uh, when they've taken in a toxic level of the uh, endophyte. There's some that are fairly minor and some that get pretty dramatic. The minor symptoms, I guess, would be elevated body temperature. Generally, what you see there is instead of cattle out in the pasture grazing when it gets 80 degrees, they're standing in the pond. And generally, if you drive through the country and you see the whole herd standing in the pond and it's really not that hot, uh, those cattle have ingested high levels of, of endophyte and they've got some toxicity and they're trying to cool off. They're not doing you a whole lot of good standing in the pond. They're not, you know, making milk, putting on gain. And most of our strategies on handling this uh, endophyte problem in fescue, uh, a lot of it can be management oriented. Sometimes you may want to convert some of that tall fescue, endophyte infected, to some warm season species. That's one management strategy. Uh, on some better land, you might uh, plant some endophyte free tall fescue. And a lot of our lands, because of other stresses, drought stresses, uh, water stresses, or whatnot, it may be a little harder to keep those endophyte free plants. They're not as uh, hardy uh, to stress as what the endophyte infected tall fescue is. Uh, so that may not always be an option. Uh, the other option is what we try to do is keep fescue vegetative as long as possible. The more vegetative we keep it, the lower hopefully the endophyte level will be. We try to get diversity of plants in there, get the legumes in there, get maybe some orchard grass in there with it, and that will dilute. So when the old cow takes a bite, she's not getting straight fescue that's got a higher level endophyte. She's getting a little bit of fescue, she's getting a little bit of red clover, a little bit of ladino. She's getting a balanced diet with a lower endophyte level. Ingesting nutrients in appropriate amounts results in benefits experienced as satiety and a liking for the flavor of the food. On the other hand, ingesting excess nutrients or toxins imposes physiological costs experienced as malaise and a dislike for the flavor of the food. Palatability operates along a continuum and virtually everything, if ingested in high enough doses, is toxic, including water and all nutrients. Old kind of naive view was that we tried to prevent deficiency, so we set some minimum amount that animals have to have but we never worried in the past about excesses. What we've come to realize, though, is that excesses of nutrients are just as bad as deficiencies. Excesses and deficits both cause problems. And I think often about some of the pastures that, that animals forage on nowadays. They're very, very nutritious kind of pastures. Missouri, for instance. Greg Bear planted a legume mix that looked like the mix from heaven, but what happened was that performance of animals was really going downhill. Greg Bear uh, started work with me about four or five years ago. He came to us. He had a farm that was basically one of the worst crop farms in the, in the, in the county. It was run down. Uh, soybean production on it uh, wasn't profitable. He could not uh, 
he, d he didn't have enough production out there to actually uh, go in and run the combine. It was that poor of ground. And he went in, he limed, he fertilized, and, it, and Greg thought that what he could do, he could go in and establish uh, chicory and ladina clover and alfalfa and red clover and archer grass and, and matua brome and have a glorious mixture of everything he needed out there and have an excellent grazing system in, in a year. And as time progressed, a year later after he planted it, we went back and, and our assessment showed we had uh, matua brome. Uh, in the field, we had uh, puna chicory and red clover, some ladina, and alfalfa. We had no orchard grass, we had no fescue. He was under the impression of, well, I've got the best of everything. I've got the candy out here. I've got the ice cream of all the everything out here with the system. And we were running fecal sample studies on his farm, and, and from the fecal samples, we were showing that protein levels were running in excess of 24, 25%, and, and digestibility is about 74%. Well, with that in mind, we thought, we've got a perfect system here, the cattle will gain. But what we found out is that our performance was going downhill. Uh, cattle just were not performing the way they, way they, they should have. And it, it really hit home to Greg and me about two years ago when we were turning cattle into a field of eastern gamma grass and, and uh, ladina clover. Ladina clover made about 75% of the stand. Eastern gamma grass made up the rest. But we had some waterways, we had some edges of the field that had not been, that had not been disturbed and had stands of old fescue there from the farming operation. And when we turned the cattle in, they'd go out and they'd selectively graze through there and they'd pick out the eastern gamma grass and, and some of the clover. But then all of a sudden the cattle would just make a beeline to this, this fescue that was really over mature for that time of the year and just nub it to the ground. While they were in this rotation on, on four or five paddocks of just pure clover, they would go in the clover fields and head straight for the fescue. And they would just chew it right down to the ground. And then they would, when the fescue was gone, then they'd go back on the clovers. One of the problems there was there was simply too much protein in the diet. Um, a lot of the protein will be in the form of non-protein nitrogen. That's for, converted very quickly to ammonia in the rumen, and that causes toxicity problems. So it's not just deficiencies that we need to be concerned about, but excesses and deficits both. So we went back in and we overseeded all the fields. We drilled in fescue. Most of those fields now have, have reverted uh, to where we've got a very strong mixture of uh, cool season grasses in those. So that's, this has really helped us out quite a bit. And our performance, uh, Greg said he can see his cattle on a daily basis just outperforming anything they've done in the previous four years. Cattle are looking really good now. Um, we are estimating they're gaining uh, two pounds, maybe a little bit more a day on, on good days. And it's just a better balanced diet for them. They look better, they act better, and it just uh, they're easier to control, it seems like. And everything's just, just working better. And then, other, you know, just like the dairyman out there that we've got, he's, he's finding the same thing. He cannot go with the straight clovers. When he goes with straight clovers, he finds his milk production dropping off. And he sees it right away in the tank. And uh, from, that, from that, we know that we've got to maintain that high uh, grass component in there. A body is an integrated society of cells and organs, all with needs for nutrients and limited abilities to cope with toxins. Cells and organs interact with one another and with the palate through feedback mediated by nerves, neurotransmitters, and hormones. Feedback is how cells and organs influence which foods and how much of those foods are eaten. Feedback is critical for health and well-being. That aversion that's formed based on toxicosis or the preference that's formed based on nutrient illustrate the plasticity of the system. In other words, we, we don't have to know a priori about the foods in an environment. And if you think about a species, the average lifetime of a species is some several million years. The foods the creatures of that species are going to encounter vary tremendously across time and space over that length of a time period. The plasticity there is to relate the flavor of a food, whatever that is, with the consequences of ingesting the food. And so that's, that's really the learned part and the beauty of, of what natural selection's done to create creatures that are flexible, that can learn based upon consequences.